Okay, so can, let me just explain. In my debate, uh, I am very relaxed up here because the burden of proof is completely on Dr. Tofig because I, all she has to prove is that putting a piece of plastic in a child has to be so much more effective than the way we're doing it that it justifies leaving a foreign body in a patient forever. So you have a lot of burden on you. For me, I just have to prove that what we're doing works. I have a disclosure, ConMed honorarium. So th this is all of us. We all say that we all truly, honestly believe that we are doing the best, so I don't fault anyone. We really think our way is the best. And in kids, this is just a review for all of you, this is what we do in a child is we do a high ligation of the sac, and in adults, which looks the same, <laughs> we do a muscle or mesh repair. Very different operations, and maybe very different patients. So we actually did a survey study. We asked uh, thousands of adult surgeons and pediatric surgeons, how would you fix this child's uh, hernia, and these were the choices we were given. And we realized that we could group the results into two groups. We saw that half of the people said that they would do a, a floor repair, a muscle or mesh repair, and the other half said that they would do a high ligation. Uh, sorry, I messed those up. The, the left side is high ligation, and the right side is floor or mesh. They were trained in the same books, mm -hmm. and the only difference is that they were in different specialties. So completely opposite approaches, on the exact same patient, only because we were taught by different people. So what is this? This is a hole. What is this hole? So I'm gonna remind you what this hole is. During development in embryology, as the testicle migrated down, the, the peritoneum invaginated with it through the muscles, not into the muscles. They went through in between the normal muscular planes. No hole was made. This went through the normal muscular planes. And that is why we a high ligation works. This peritoneum accidentally got in between some muscles. You just need to remove that peritoneum and the muscles will close. And we know it works. We know that in children it works at least as we follow them through 18 years of life, we know that it works, that they have a, a minute recurrence rate. Why does it work? It works because of what I just said. The peritoneum is removed, and then things shut or close. All you gotta remove is what's in the way. So to make it clear, uh, this is an example. So if there's a towel in a door, and you remove the towel, the door will close. That's why it works. If you remove what's in the way, it will close. You don't need to put a barricade over the door. The door will close if you remove what's in the way. So if, if high ligation works for a child, when is it inappropriate? Are these different? Are the hole in this patient versus the hole in the other patient, are they different holes? That's what we have to figure out. Who would do uh, mesh in this patient? Who would do mesh in this patient? I want you to tell me when you would start putting mesh. You can feel free to raise your hand if you would put mesh in any, would you put mesh in her? She's about an inch taller, not yet. What about in him? No one here, not a single person here would put mesh in this patient. One, one person. You would all do a high ligation? One, I, I like the hands are going up quietly. <laughs> Who would do a high ligation in this patient? Who would? In an indirect hernia, who would put mesh in this patient for an indirect hernia? It's about divided. Okay, so is there a point? How do we know, right? It changes, right? Because So we, with data shows that mesh and muscle works in adults, and the data shows that high ligation works in kids. When, do we, when does it change? So we do know that things change. We know that things change because direct hernias develop. Yes, as a pediatric surgeon, I've been practicing for almost 13 years, I have only seen one direct hernia, and it was iatrogenic after another surgeon tried to do an open high ligation. So it is incredibly rare. You all, the adult surgeons, I'm assuming, have seen your fair share of direct hernias. So we know things change because I don't see them and you do. So something changes, and my theory, Kay Vaziri sitting right over there, our theory, 
is that that may be an indication when the physiology changes. That may be some indication that the anatomy, the physiology, the path of the physiology changes when we start seeing direct hernias. So we looked at two centers, an adult hospital, George Washington, and a children's hospital. We combined our patients together, and we wanted to see when do direct hernias start. The first thing we noticed, okay, these slides, this data came out this morning, fresh off the press, right? So this showed first thing that's amazing. First of all, hernias are bimodal. All hernias, inguinal hernias are bimodal. They're huge in infancy, then they tank down during adolescence, that's why very few of us do that many adolescent hernias, and then they go up again during adulthood. Fascinating discovery. This is what we looked at. We looked at age group of when do direct hernias start. The red is indirect hernias. They start right off in infancy. Then you slowly start to see direct hernias start to develop. And that line I drew is a point of inflection where there's a statistical change where there's an increased growth around 40 years of age. But you really start to see it in the teens, 16 to 18 years of age, we start to see that there's an inflection point when direct hernias start to develop. This might be when the floors start changing. And maybe this is, so I have a question. If I told you that a certain percentage of patients would have a direct hernia, so in an infant, let's say it's 0%, what percent would you say at that age group, it's time for them to start getting mesh, even for an indirect hernia? Who would say 10%? Raise your hand. One person. Who would say 5%? Would anyone say 5% is enough of a risk that if they have a 5% chance of getting a direct hernia at that age, that's enough of a reason for me to put mesh? What about 20%? 20%, the hands are going up. 20% seems to be, what about 30? 30, 40, 40 over there, 50, something higher. So I'm seeing 20, 30%. Okay, so this is what the data showed. The data showed that when you look at, look at that, th these are all under 30%. So when you look at a teenager, like uh, at around, whoops, at around, let's say 17, 18, it's 10%. They have a 10% chance, 90% chance they have an indirect hernia, so most likely, in my opinion, they're physiologically still a child. So we looked at the results, the multi-center retrospective review, children between the ages of 13 and 18. We found that when you do an open high ligation in a child, in an adolescent, they have a 2% recurrence rate. Five-year follow-up, five-year follow-up. What about laparoscopic? The laparoscopic is just basically taking a stitch around the, the patent processus vaginalis. So it's a laparoscopic suture ligature. We looked at 10 centers. We had a 3% recurrence rate. We did add one extra person that brought us up to 6%. <laughs> but before that, it was 3%. So one final point to make is that please distinguish between direct and indirect. A lot of you just say it's a hernia. We're going to throw some mesh down there. My guess is when we start stratifying between direct and indirect, we're going to find that you're putting a lot of unnecessary mesh in. These patients uh, probably just need a high ligation. So in conclusion, adolescents probably don't need mesh, and further studies are needed to stratify who may benefit from non-mesh repairs. Thank you.